Todd's annual articulation conference. I was trying to think on the way in which annual this is. Um, I think we're moving on 8th or 9th or 10th, somewhere around this. There will be a yellow basket at the registration table. And we'd like you to have your evaluation and or support request for further growth. Um, drop in the basket at the end of the conference or any time during the conference in which uh, you have the opportunity to do so. One other thing, if you did not have the opportunity to register at the registration table, which is at this doorway, uh, nearest morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. We're very happy that, that so many of you could be with us this morning. And you and your students and the direction of public education of the peninsula, which is why we're all in the profession that we're in. And then secondly, we talk about a theme that we that really grew out of last year's articulation conference that deals with our role in a rapidly changing society with a changing workforce and an expectation on the part of society that we will prepare increasingly a large percentage of our students who are prepared to face the 21st century when we don't know for sure what the 21st century is going to look like. So I'll start first by trying to give a brief overview and update about some things that are happening at Thomas Community College and introduce a few new colleagues at the college to help me. This past year was an unexpected surprise and benefits in our ability to serve more students. During the past year, our enrollment grew by almost 15%. We now are and have been for some time the largest single campus community college in Virginia. We serve this year almost 11,000 different students during the entire academic year. And during the fall, we had almost 7,400 students at our college. The largest single and fastest growing group of students that we have is somewhat of a surprise too. Unlike the demography which shows a shifting population that's getting older, our student body is uh, getting younger. The largest increase of students we have this fall were our recent high school graduates who are preparing to transfer to a four-year college after completing two years at Thomas Nelson Community College. Most of them in our arts and sciences program. And that's a real surprise for us, a very pleasant surprise, because increasingly our student was characterized by the part-time adult student. And now a very sudden shift in full-time enrollment of relatively young students. These are your students. These are students that are finding it increasingly difficult to afford the growing cost of higher education. And whose families are finding that it's a good bargain to look to the community college as a means of financing the first two years of education. This is a year also where we completed the second year of a study that we're doing with Christopher Newport College on the success of our college transfer students. The preliminary results over the past two years that we're still studying them show that students that come to Thomas Nelson Community College and then transfer do as well or slightly better as the native students at the receiving four-year institution. If the student will complete 30 or more hours with us, students that take one or two courses and then transfer often don't do as well as those that stay with us for a longer period of time. Very interesting findings, I think. The second part of the update that I'd like to share with you is something that we've been working on with you for the past four years. Tom, uh, would you mind turning that uh, overhead on, please? Let's begin. I'd like to welcome you to the discussion group meeting on mentoring. My name is Judy McMillan. I'm the coordinator of admissions and records at Thomas Nelson Community College. The purpose of this discussion is to provide a description of an exciting pilot program in mentoring in one of the public high schools on the peninsula. It represents a partnership between education and business and industry. Before I give you a brief overview of the agenda of this session, I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, on, my, on my right, your left, is uh, 
Carmen McCorney, Jr., who is a customer service supervisor at Virginia Natural Gas. And next is Meredith Bell, president and owner of Transitions Incorporated. To my immediate right is uh, Lori Conan, the director of human resources at Seaman Bendix Automotive. And on my left is Janice Walden, the vice president of Grace Industries Incorporated. We have something in common panel members, that, and that is that we're all members of the Peninsula Leadership Institute, uh, um, I believe it's referred to as the Leadership Institute of the Virginia Peninsula, class of 1990. Also in the audience, I think we have another uh, Leadership Institute member, Bobby Wright. Are there any others? We'll tell you a little bit more about the Leadership Our primary objective is to exchange information and learn from one another and hopefully generate some new ideas. After my description of the community structure leading up to the mentoring program, Speedy, is, um, Speedy McCorney will review some of the research findings on mentoring throughout the country. And then Meredith will tell you how specifically the Leadership Institute Class of 1990 is proceeding with the pilot at Phoebus High School. Lauren will give a business perspective on the incentives for mentoring in the high school. And then Janice will summarize and react to the comments that have been made. At that point, we would like to invite your involvement by asking you to help us answer the question, how can business best help our high school students, best help our kids? And we'd also like to find out from you how you feel um, the best method to proceed with future mentoring programs on the campus. So now a little bit about how we came to this point. Like many good ideas, mentoring in the high schools is an effort occurring on a variety of fronts. The desired outcome, of course, is to improve students' understanding of various careers, professions, and opportunities for future education. The mentoring program, first of all, appears in the white page that each of you have in your packet. It, it uh, is one of the recommendations, and it's uh, recommendation number three, and it says, uh, we recommend the expanded use of an industry-based mentoring program for high school students to give them a real-world taste of excitement involved in the technical career field. That was uh, kind of the, the beginning of our discussion on, men on the mentoring uh, idea. The Chamber of Commerce has taken responsibility for implementing this recommendation. And the Training Committee, which is a subgroup of Big Ed, has been charged with implementing a mentoring program regionally. Bill Castro from Newport News Shipbuilding is the chairperson of the Training Committee. Are you here, Bill? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, there is Bill in that. Uh, also on that committee are Ann Bernard and Bob Wright, who are the decision So we have a lot of key players in this room. As I understand it, mentoring is one of a four pronged approach that the training committee hopes to use. The other approaches are internship, co op, and apprenticeship. Is that right, Bill? Yes. Charlie Kalinsky told me. We asked Charlie to be here today, for those of you who know her from the chamber, but she uh, had a, uh, another commitment and was not able to join us. So in addition to the training committee through Big Ed, there's another arm of the Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, and that is the Leadership Institute. The Institute is in, I believe, its seventh year. And it exists to develop community leaders from diverse backgrounds. Uh, this year is the largest class ever, I believe it's uh, 25 or so. It's a very rich program. Each class is required to pool its energies uh, and come up with, with a class project by the end of the year. This year, the leadership class has 
have chosen to develop a model of mentoring program, we decided to focus on education um, over some of the other possible topics like transportation, the drug problem, or regionalism, because we felt that stressing partnerships with business, education, and government to prepare students for the careers of the 1990s and beyond was the most critical need uh, before us. So, in summary then, the training committee is studying the progress of the Leadership Institute's <coughs> project, and after that pilot program, there will be an evaluation, refinements will be made, and a written proposal will be developed on how to expand mentoring regionally. So we're beginning with one high school, and after we see how successful that is, we'll uh, hopefully be able to develop an export package so that it can be used at other high schools and middle schools as well. With that uh, brief overview of how we got to the uh, point where we are now, uh, I'd like to ask Speedy to give us some uh, results of the findings of the leadership class that's uh, done in research and mentoring nationwide. Thanks, Speedy. Mm -hmm. Meredith is a professional speaker. She said she should stand up and do these things. <laughs> this informal and basically what I want to do is kind of tell you how we got started in this, why we got started, what the information we found and try to, since I'm part of the research committee is what we call it, um, finding out this was going on today really, really struck home. We hope to use you guys towards the end to give us some more ideas of how we can help. Um, <clears throat> what we did first, we went nationwide, did a lot of research trying to find out what mentorship was, what mentoring was. Well, we found out nobody really knew. Uh, how do you describe it? Uh, we had definitions from uh, shadowing to big brothers, big sisters, uh, all the way down to uh, hiring them in the summer. I mean, you name it, it covered the gamut. So that was our first problem, to try to figure out what we were going to define this mentorship as so we could figure out how we fit into the project. During this research, we found out from the people that had experimented with this type of thing, several problems that came up with the mentorship or with business involvement in the schools. And one of them was the fact that the goals that most of these companies set, or most of these programs set, were too wide range. Uh, to build self-esteem of the students, that's very important, but it, how can you define that? How can you quantify the results? Uh, to make them feel, you know, the self-esteem, make them have more responsibility, make them be, be more goal-oriented, things like this, they're important. But it was part of the problem that some of these programs haven't succeeded was because they didn't have a specific end of what they're trying to reach. Uh, also, what we found was the commitment that the companies and the businesses and people involved with mentoring was somewhat suspect. Um, a lot of the counselors we talked to and a lot of the research we found was, in some respects, it's better not to even get involved if you're not going to get involved and finish the project. I think all of you guys would agree with that, with that uh, approach. So we, we took these things and we kind of broke it down to a more local area and said, well, let's find out how we can make them work in, in the peninsula. So what we did, we split our institute group up, group up into two parts, and one half started doing some research to find out how we could fit in on the peninsula. So the other half decided to go into the schools and start experimenting with some of the projects, which I think the other people will explain how that's working out. But we first all, first of all went to, maybe some of you were the ones we talked to, we first talked to some principals on how can business help, tell us what you would like to have. And then we decided after we all pulled our thoughts on that, we got back with the guidance counselors. And I've never seen a more receptive group than the guidance counselors that we've talked to. It was like, guys, somebody asked us what we thought about this, and I thought that was that impressed me because I feel like in order for this program to work, we have to get involved very closely with the guidance counselors at whatever level we're working at. That was the question. What level of uh, children do we try to, to use the mentorship? Elementary school, high school, middle school. Of course, the guidance counselors we were talking to felt like their area was the one that needed the most and, and for valid reasons. But uh, <coughs> pretty much that's how we had kind of formatted our, our research and trying to figure out what it is. And out of all of this, what we decided to come up with as far as three basic ideas of what we wanted to do to have the mentorship program work. We want to have a form 
of linking students with business. Now there's several ways of doing that, and the, one of them being uh, panel groups like this in the schools, one-to-one -one programs with the students that can be set up through the guidance counselors, career days, of course, things like this, but that should be part of what we consider the mentorship program, is getting this link set up between the guidance counselors and the students and the business community. Um, also, we felt like it, uh, we should have some way of actually, once this link is made, of showing these students how the actual <coughs> how the actual business is in real life. Let them go ride with the policemen, let them ride with the uh, shadowy type programs, or let them get involved, per se, or a business-student relationship. And hopefully within all these contacts, we can build the <coughs> ethics of, of business. Um, you have to come work at 8 o'clock. You have to dress certain ways in most cases. It's a responsible position. Uh, you have to get paid to buy these things. You, know, you have to understand this. We feel like we're talking to a lot of these people that some of the kids don't understand that what's involved actually going out to get a job wherever you want to. So this is kind of three areas that we're trying to focus on right now. Uh, we haven't got it down pat and tried to get our goals even closer than that is what we'd like to do. But, uh, that's pretty much the, the overall idea of what we've got. We hope to get some ideas from you guys today that will say, well, this is what I need. Can you throw this in somewhere? And, and we're very, we're at the very early stages of this development. So hopefully we'll get some feedback from you today and help us out. So with that, I'll turn it over to Meredith who will kind of explain what we've done so far. So. Good morning. She's setting me up. Professional speaker, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm real excited though, to share with you some of the specifics of what we've actually been able to put into place. Uh, it's challenging getting, and it's 32 people in this class, which is a lot, getting them coordinated. Uh, and, but we found that this is this particular project has been an excellent way to get everyone involved. Early on, when we were discussing how can we put a mentorship program into place, what schools should we look at, uh, we realized we were operating under a very limited time constraint because. Our class actually graduates June the 5th, and we had to have a formal presentation ready by then for what we've accomplished. So one resource person that we had invited in to talk at one of our planning sessions was Lorraine Hall. Some of you know Lorraine, she is a, in fact, she's giving a presentation, I think, right next door on Project Focus. She's a Project Focus counselor this year at Phoebus High. She works at Thomas Nelson and also at Phoebus. And they had already identified a group of 125 seniors who were at, um, Level two, everybody knows what uh, in this group. No, not level two. They were, see, I just thought it was because we were in public <laughs> education. Uh, level two students were enrolled in 12, 12, Engl 12 two English classes where they were not the college bound students, but they, they were not the severe dropout risk either. And the purpose of this particular program was to get them more interested in pursuing college and continuing on with their learning. And realizing our time constraints, it turned out to be a perfect situation for us to simply tie in to that existing program. There were already the students identified, and we could get something measurable as opposed to trying to spread out to a lot of different schools. So what we've ended up doing is setting up times, let me back up, we originally sent out a survey to the students that indicated all the people who were in our particular class and what our particular occupations and areas of expertise were. And what's neat about this class is that we have a, a rich variety of backgrounds. We have people in banking, we have hotel, motel industry, we have manufacturing, <coughs> excuse me, we have uh, education. So that the students had a wide range of career opportunities. They could select any of the ones that they were interested in and sign up. And based on the number of students who responded to the different career possibilities, then we set up two different ways that they could meet with us. The first one was individually, where an individual person from our Leadership Institute class would go in and meet with a group of students and talk to them particularly about their career choice. For example, a police officer at Newport News and a gentleman from the Sheriff's Department both had very high response. So they met individually with students. Some of the other <coughs> careers that either people didn't know that much about or they didn't select those individuals still got to participate, those of us from the Leadership Institute, on what they call role model panels. And during the month of April, all of us are going into the school.
schools, either individually or as a panel. And we're going to be talking to them a little bit about what our particular career involves, as well as stressing what Speedy mentioned, the ethics of work. What's involved in being a responsible adult in a work situation? Because in interviewing people, this is one of the key areas that was brought up that doesn't seems to fall through the cracks sometimes. If they don't get formal instruction on how to be responsible, how to be a responsible employee. So each of us that is going in and speaking to these students is aware of that. So we're going to be hammering it in in our own individual styles, not in a lecturing manner, but just incorporating it as part of carrying out our particular job function, whatever it might involve. From those particular interactions, then the students will be able to sign up for opportunities to visit us at our workplace. Ideally, we will be taking this project even further beyond our graduation date in June where we can maintain relationships with these students and allow them to come more often to our work sites. But we wanted to give them the chance to come out to the workplace, hopefully more than one time, and actually see what goes on in our jobs, what's entailed in a variety of levels. So it'd be a, a, a sort of a shadowing situation, uh, but still give them an opportunity to get out in the workforce before they're actually in there as an employee. So that's where we are right now. What I think is going to be exciting is the end product that we are looking at for our project is not a research paper, but a video, hence the taping today. Uh, we are looking to produce a video in 10 to 15 minutes in duration that will give any company that's interested or any organization that's interested in getting involved with mentoring step by step how to do it. It won't be a lecture format, it will be actually showing some scenes where the students have interacted with some of the mentors who've gone to the school and to the work sites, and we'll give them some specific ways of getting involved. So again, we are interested in getting your input too, and we'll be asking for that shortly. So as we're mentioning things this morning, if you'll jot down some ideas that you have of how we could make it better, how you think it could be effective, we would really appreciate that. We've been narrow in our focus intentionally this time just so we could find some way of tracking and measuring our results. And we'll be doing evaluations with the students and with the mentors to find out how it works and what they would recommend so that it can constantly be refined and not something that is dropped off. We're hoping that there'll be at least a core group of our class this year that will want to continue working with that so that we have a, a true mentoring project in place. Not to the glory, but we'll talk about I'm not going to stand up because I'm not even going to pretend to be a professional speaker. Um, I'm Director of Human Resources and Student Center with Siemens Automotive. I was asked today to talk really from the business perspective of why businesses, <coughs> excuse me, would want to be involved in mentoring. What's the incentive? And I wanted to start by drawing an in interesting parallel of something that I saw in the paper yesterday. I know most of you are probably aware of Earth Day. Well, there's a uh, corresponding program in Washington, D.C. this week called Earth Tech. And it's a um, really a combination of a number of companies involved in technical fields that are getting together in Washington, D.C., exploring alternative technical um, strategies and product lines that are maybe less harmful to the environment than some of the things we use today. We have to be involved in it. And there was an article in the paper yesterday in the Daily Press that, that spoke about a uh, environmental activist group who is protesting, I think there were 25 arrests or something like that, at Earth Tech, <coughs> protesting the involvement of, of major corporations, <coughs> calling it a farce and suggesting that, that possibly the only reason that these companies were involved is, is for public relations. I have a little different perspective on that. I, I, I think um, I think there's probably there's some truth to that, but I, I think what people tend to forget is that corporations are people too. We have kids, we have kids in the school systems, we've got grandkids, um, we hope our grandkids and our kids have kids uh, someday, and obviously we want a good environment and a good world for them. Uh, the other point is obviously if, if there weren't corporations, there wouldn't be an economy and we really wouldn't be worried a lot about the environment. So I mean there's a balance that needs to, needs to occur. But, the reason I wanted to start with that is that a lot of people would think that the, the primary reason that a company may want to get involved in something as time consuming as, as mentoring would be PR, good community relations, nice thing to do, get your name out there in the paper. And sure, yeah, 
together. Some of that is true. Uh, I'm also not going to argue that a lot of us in corporations are parents. We'd like to think that our kids in school systems have mentors and have access and exposure to people um, in different fields. So that's the, there are a couple of, I guess, if you want to call it selfish motives, they're there. Um, but my belief is that really the primary reason that you're seeing a lot of interest from companies in things like mentoring is that we are concerned about the workforce of the future. In fact, we're concerned about the workforce of today. Um, but we are concerned about the workforce of the future and the economy of the future economy of our companies and of our, of our country as a, as a whole. Um, I've got this book, and I, you probably mostly have seen it, but if any of you have not seen this book, which is Workforce 2000, I really strongly recommend it. It's a compilation of statistics um, presented in a way that's not too dry, but it, it really tends to make you think. What the groups uh, <coughs> that have put together this book have done is really looked at trends both in, in demographics in this country and our population base and also in the workplace. And they're really presenting a picture of what they believe the year 2000 is going to look like and what the issues are going to be and are suggesting very strongly that we think about doing something about it. And I, I've got a few things that I wanted to mention from the book. Obviously, there's a trend towards higher educational requirements. This book estimates that over half of the new positions that will be created between 1985 and the year 2000 are going to require more than a high school diploma. It's more than half. They said 33%, I believe it was, are going to require a college degree. Um, they're talking about, when they talk about more than a high school diploma, they're talking about things like language, math, reasoning skills, things that, that you guys are, are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And really, the business community is a little slow think has been a little slow in picking up those as, as major issues. Um, there's also going to be a significant increase in the, in the higher skilled technical based positions in companies, especially manufacturing companies, as opposed to the low end or assembly unskilled type labor. We're seeing that today at Siemens Automotive. Um, we, can, we can put a robot in and do unskilled assembly. Companies can, can manufacture that kind of technology and those kind of components in Brazil at 60 cents an hour. Those things are not a problem in this country. The problem is that we can't subcontract or ship out our brain trust. And, and the belief is, is that we have got to be able to focus on, on increased technical skills and capabilities of employees. As I said, you know, the book really references the year 2000. We're seeing it today at Siemens Automotive. We, we spend, and I, and I think we may be a little higher than average, but not, uh, not out of the ballpark. We're spending about 3 to 4% of our payroll each year on training and education. The problem, unfortunately, and that's, that's a good number and that's wonderful, but the problem is, is, is too much of that is allocated to basic skills education. We've got basic GED training, basic reading, basic math. Uh, all the time and money we spend on that and we take employees off the job is less time we can spend on the blueprint reading, advanced electronics, those kind of things, to be able to help us compete globally. Um, another, another focus of the book, as I said, is the shifting demographics of the workforce. They estimate that 85% of the new entrants into the labor market in the next 15 years are going to be women or minorities. Um, again, I'm sure you guys are seeing that today. We're seeing that today. Unfortunately, um, these groups are not traditionally the groups that have pursued the technical fields, and in some cases haven't even pursued advanced education in the same proportion as their, as their percentage of the population. Uh, by the year 2000, 47% of the workforce is expected to be women, 15% women working. So you're talking about more than half of the, of the workforce is going to be minority. You've got to stop calling it minority at some point and, and start addressing it as not a side issue. But this is the mainstream now. So I guess I want to say a conclusion is that from a business perspective, mentoring is a way that, that we can reach the workforce of the year 2000 before they make decisions and, uh, and do things that will either uh, exclude them from certain career occupations or create tremendous economic issues for us, both in our companies and, and in, the, in the country in general. We 
hope that we can, as, as Speedy and Meredith have both pointed out very well, provide role models and things like work ethics. What do we expect in attendance, attendance of employees? Um, why is geography important? I, I had a very difficult time understanding why geography important, was important in school, and I was a good student. So we're in a global economy now. I've got a, another facility in Pisa, Italy. We're trying to explain to employees Pisa, Italy, European economic reform that's going on right now. The whole Eastern Bloc issue and, and what kind of new avenues that opens up for us in the automotive field. We had Lada, which is a huge automotive automotive company we've never heard of, but it's in a Soviet firm. So they're in visiting, looking at our fuel injectors. And we and these are new, and we're all struggling with learning these things. So again, it was to step back a little bit, the um, the real interest in our part is, is that we see this as an investment, as a way of reaching kids, uh, helping the teachers, working as allies with the guidance counselors, uh, exposing kids to more careers than just teaching and just what their parents have them to do. And, and hopefully they'll make some decisions that, that will better prepare them to work with us in the future. Thank you. Thank you.
where the guidance counselors are linking the students with us, us being a corporation or a business. Now, luckily, we've got a lot of different diverse backgrounds in our particular group. But we're getting coming to the guidance counselors and saying, here's a group that wants to get involved. These are what they're interested in. These are their backgrounds. These are their hobbies, their activities. Find some kids that want to, to get with us that are interested in our particular field or our particular interest. We've done that. It's worked out real well. We've got a lot of good discussions with the kids at Phoebus. And the next step is we've had some interest in going with the person to their workplace. So the progression is somewhat natural once you make the contact. And that's where we're at right now. Uh, as far as peninsula-wide or system-wide, we haven't done that. The time constraints have kept us pretty tight. Well, and that's, yeah, I think that's why we're here. I'm not yeah, sure. But um, the, what we're doing at Phoebus is really just a pilot that happens to be going on at the same time as we're trying to answer the very question that you've asked, which is, what would we recommend to the peninsula in terms of what mentoring ought to be? And, and we have some opinions about that. We also have some opinions that what it would look like in the elementary school level is probably different than what it would look like in middle school and what it would look at in high school. Um, and we've individually talked to some guidance counselors and some principals about their thoughts on that. And the, and the thought, again, was having this group captured here for a period of, of time is it, another wonderful way to get the input from you in terms of what is it a partnership, one-on-one -on -one kind of thing for a period of time that makes the most, most sense? What is it that you guys are seeing that kids are missing where businesses can come in and, and, and help out? Just to get a little more background, how many kids have you all worked with so far? Are you doing this during class time? Is this after school activity? It's during class. Lorraine has been working with her English teachers. And I just spoke with her a little while ago. Probably the largest group that's attended so far has been a group of 15 students. We've had a smaller group as five or six with uh, either a panel or with an individual. And throughout the month of April, we'll have probably 30 of the people in our class, 25 to 30, will be going to the school. There will be some overlap. Some students are going to want to see more than one occupation. So we'll have some duplication in the numbers there, but I don't have a total yet. But we'll have that. So are these kids just they've met one time at this point, and now you're planning on continuing to meet with them? Or is this? What we've I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make that clear. Let me just give an example. Uh, the gentleman from the sheriff's department went in one morning, mm -hmm. and they're doing it during the English period, so it's mm -hmm. one period of class, and they're being excused from that class yeah. to attend it. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the individual who's going in, I'll say for the sake of terms, mentor, is giving a brief presentation of their career and giving the students an opportunity to ask them questions about it. Okay. So at this point, it's an information sharing situation at the school. And once the students then identify one area or two areas that they're especially interested in, then our next step that we'll be doing in May, and that's why Stevie is saying it's still in process of evolution, mm -hmm is that we will be matching up the students to come with the mentor to their workplace. Now, ideally, when we think of mentoring, we think of one-on-one. -on -one. Because of our time constraints, it's probably going to turn out that we may have two or three students going with one mentor to their workplace and having an opportunity as a small group to learn about that occupation in more depth. Our hope is that if there is a strong interest on the part of the student, then we can continue that relationship and arrange that between the student and the mentor. We're trying to get more businesses involved in having students to come to work. I know uh, last summer we had a student come in and uh, work with us at Great Rivers. We were probably that day this year. And it, it, we learn a lot. I think uh, packing up the kids is here right for New Horizons. And I know New Horizons has an, an active mentorship program going with the uh, governor's Does that in any way resemble what we're talking about, Pat? Uh, <clears throat> Judy, ours started off a little different, where it's uh, an instructional uh, component of the program that is uh, actually a credit. The students get a credit as part of the free credit course, and they spend uh, anywhere from 90 to a couple hundred hours uh, at the various mentorships throughout the community. Some of those are 
exhibited here today, and it's uh, mainly research based, and uh, we've had a lot of success with it. Uh, we've been doing it since '85, and it's grown each year very time consuming. You need, uh, if you have a full blown program in the school, you need a coordinator to handle it. That's what we learned, and that's what Lorraine Hall has been for us on this project. Perhaps we ought to uh, dispense with the idea of uh, going into groups since uh, time is short, so why don't we proceed with the uh, questions and answers? <coughs> I would ask one thing, though. As Meredith said, uh, uh, if you jot down your thoughts and your, your suggestions to us, we really do need them from you before you leave, uh, maybe not this, this session. I think Bill has a comment. Yeah, Judy, I just want to follow up with uh, the questions asked earlier. With the training committee from Big Ed, we had very much the same dif difficulty when we first started. We're, we're looking at all student uh, work experience opportunities, not just mentoring. And so we had a real difficult time defining mentor, intern, co-op, extern even come out, uh, apprenticeship, and just what are the differences, what are the components to make up each of those. We spent our first two sessions doing nothing but making certain we could define, uh, I might say it's a little, our mentoring definition is a little bit different than uh, what, but it's very close. Uh, and that committee uh, hopefully is going to be publishing a, a document that will <coughs> hopefully um, list both education and business concepts of those uh, opportunities. Specifically, it happens to fall that way here in Phoenix, but it can go with it, whichever way the business will shift out. I was going to suggest that um, I understand why you're using the web too, but I Direct the question, Meredith. Uh, in your group, are there any industry or businesses that are involved in cooperative education at any level that you know of? I was I was, was going to suggest that uh, recruit as part of four mentors, students who are in the track of studying in, in cooperative education. Uh, an example would be a, one of our students who's co-oping at NASA. Uh, work in the morning, school in the afternoon, would be an ideal person to talk to a young person about what is life in the technical world as well as what you need to do to study for it. Uh -huh. And maybe bring, uh, invite the student into the Thomas Nelson environment as well as the national environment. That's an example. Thank you. Very good. Any other thoughts on how we're open to ideas, real. Well, that's She had the, really the 
same perspective. She was talking about courses and, and levels of math that kids were choosing in middle school that would then either make or break their high school selection, or they could still take maybe the advanced diploma, but it would require some summer classes and things kids aren't generally prepared to do. So she had the same perspective of middle school would be a good place to start. Yes. One of the other things I'd like to mention is that one, one of the class meeting, uh, class project meetings we had this week, an idea came up that is something we'd also like to see put in place, and that is that the counselors have a resource uh, file or list available to them of people in the community that they could call on or in the business community. And a perfect example came up. One of our class members was meeting with a guidance counselor who was telling her of a student who was interested in becoming a police officer. He was also having a lot of personal difficulties. Our class member contacted the fellow in our class who's a police officer, and he and the student are getting together now. All right, it may not be a long-term mentorship kind of thing, but he will serve as a mentor to this student, helping him clarify what's involved in becoming a police officer, but also giving him, hopefully, some personal help, too. So we'd like to see some informal matching <coughs> in place as well. Yeah. It, uh Under 
Governor Wilder. Prior to becoming Secretary of Education, Mr. Knight was a partner in the firm of Huntley and Williams with offices in Washington, D.C., Fairfax, and Richmond. Mr. Knight has served as President of the Washington Council of Lawyers and as Chairman of the D.C. Neighborhood Legal Services Program. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Virginia Law School and an adjunct professor at Howard University in his law school. Where I've known Jim, is that uh, he plays a very important role even before becoming Secretary of Education for higher education, for he served as one of a select few to study the future of higher education in Virginia as a commissioner on the Commission on the University of the 21st Century. Jim was also on the State Board of Education, where he served in a leadership capacity on many issues. He's been active in state and national arenas as well. He served as political and domestic advisor to Vice President Walter F. Lawndale, and he has served on a number of District of Columbia Public Defender Service and District of Columbia Board of Governors. His list of activities go on and on, and so I'll uh, conclude with that brief description. Secretary Franny, currently the Secretary of Economic Development in the Governor's Cabinet, includes responsibility for 17 agencies and authorities of the Commonwealth, including such departments as the Department of Rural Trade, the Department of Economic Development, Virginia Port Authority. <coughs> Before being Secretary of Economic Development, Mr. Framing practiced law with the Richmond firm of Mazzullo, McClandish, and Framing, a practice which he formed in 1982. I've known Larry for a number of years because Larry also has been a person committed to education. Larry has been on the State Board for Community Colleges and currently is the chairman of the State Board for Community Colleges. He remains active in several bar and civic groups, including the Downtown Richmond YMCA and Leadership Metro Richmond. With those brief introductions, I'd like to invite our two guests to speak to the issue of education, business partnerships, and the future in Virginia. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction and for inviting us to participate in this event today. Uh, I did have a chance, I think, to meet some of you last night. I had an occasion to be in Norfolk and we uh, met with some of the principals and assistant principals, so I think there's some people here uh, who I had an opportunity to meet last night. I was, uh, couldn't help but think as I saw both Larry and I sitting up here about the fact that uh, sometimes people uh, in introductions pump up the secretary and how much they've done and how powerful the position is. And you start to feel good about that sometimes. You really think that, gee, you really can uh, accomplish a lot of things. Yeah. So someone came up to me once and said that we're going to be looking for an idea for a fundraiser. And we thought we'd offer this first prize, lunch with the secretary, as a way of getting people to get involved. And I felt very good about that. He was the secretary. People were going to have lunch with the secretary in the first prize. So I found out that the second prize was two lunches with the secretary. We're going to bring you back down to earth from that. <laughs> but seriously, it's a real pleasure to be here and to have an opportunity to participate uh, and for us to be together on the same stage. Because there's one thing that we've been trying to push is one word that symbolizes what we would like to do in this administration is partnership. And we've talked about partnership all across this Commonwealth. And if people stop and take a look at some of the areas that we're concerned about, you will see that there's no greater partnership, no better way for us to work together than through economic development and through education. So that's why I was very pleased to have the opportunity to come and share a few moments with you this morning. Because those two areas are natural allies. Because as we take a look at the year 2000 and where we're going to be moving, some issues that come to pass have to do with the workforce, the nature of work, and the workforce. And I think that most of the reports, most of the demographics show that as we move toward the year 2000, there are going to be new demands made on our workforce. The, the workers are going to be moving into those jobs, are going to have to have more skills, they're going to have to be better technically trained, they're going to have to understand a little better the global perspective, they're going to have to be prepared for fierce economic competition. And in order for these people to be prepared, they have to be educated. 
We also have to look at the fact that the demographics indicate that there will be a new workforce in the year 2000. We will see that there will be more minorities involved in the workforce, more women involved in the workforce, more immigrants involved in the workforce. And that means we have to do something to reach out to those individuals to make sure that they too are prepared for the challenge of the year 2000. The reports, and I think Larry is probably going to go into some detail about the specifics of the requirements of that workforce and where these people are coming, are going to present some new challenges for us. They're going to raise issues that perhaps we've not focused on before. One of which is going to be the issue of child care. I'm not sure how much discussion we've had here, but one way to increase the number of people that go into the workforce or to, to meet the demands of the workforce is to increase the number of people who move into it. And in order to do that, we're going to have to look at the issue of child care. And I mention that even though that's not an issue that you may be addressing, but it does relate to it because those of you who are involved in the community colleges and four year institutions are going to have to face up to that issue as well because that will allow more people to go into the workforce because they will be satisfied that their young people will be participating in some quality child care programs. But more importantly for this discussion, what's going to be required for these workers to prepare them for the year 2000 is to be better educated. They're going to have to have better basic skills. They're going to have to have an understanding of what the workforce demands. And they're going to have to be given the, the, the point that if they are going to get meaningful jobs, they have to be prepared. The number of jobs that you can get with less than a high school education are dwindling rapidly. And if you are going to be a productive member of society, you have to be educated. So that's where there's a, a dovetailing of interest, because the business community, as Larry will point out, is concerned about the quality of workers that are coming to them. They're concerned because they have a vested interest, not because morally they think it's great, because obviously it is, but from a financial, from a business, from a profit motive, they're concerned about the quality of young people that we're turning out in our system. Because those are their future employees and employers. And unless they're satisfied that those young people possess the necessary skills, then those businesses are not going to be able to branch off and do the type of research they need, be competitive with their foreign uh, counterparts who are investing time and money and effort in their educational system to make sure that their young people are prepared for the challenges of the 21st century. As we look at those particular factors, that focuses in on you, because we cannot talk about a better educated workforce unless the educators are at the forefront of this battle, unless you're involved, unless you're rolling up your sleeves and taking an active role. And that's why I'm so glad to see so many of you are here today, because you, I think, understand the fact that you do have an important role to play. And I want to let you know from the Secretary of Education that we're behind 100% in this type of effort. Because if we're going to have a viable economy in Virginia, if we're going to be able to attract businesses to come to Virginia, if we're going to be able to create a stronger economic base, the educational system has to be strong. It has to be attractive. Because when businesses are trying to make decisions about whether or not they're going to locate the peninsula or northern Virginia, or whether or not they're going to go off to South Carolina or somewhere else, one of the first things they look at is the educational system, both K-12 and higher ed. K through 12 because they're concerned about the quality of education that their kids are going to get. Higher ed simply because they're concerned about the kind of working relationship that they're going to have with the higher ed community, both our two-year institutions and our four-year institutions. So you have a central role to play. You will be essential to determine whether or not we're able to succeed in preparing our young people for the 21st century. That's why, as we look ahead, particularly here for Peninsula, we're concerned about the fact that there are some projections that there will be a lot of jobs available, but we may not have the number of workers uh, to fill those jobs. And I realize when we talk about projections that sometimes uh, we get different projections from different people. And in fact, I'm also reminded of what the great philosopher Yogi Berra once said, that making predictions is one of the most difficult things you can do, particularly about the future. <laughs> <laughs> but the projections are that there will be jobs, but there will not be enough young people to fill them. That means we've got to do something now. We've got to take some aggressive action to make sure that there are enough young people in the pipeline to fill these jobs. It will require some background in scientific areas, technical areas, engineering, what have you. We have got to take some aggressive action, and that's what's being talked about in this conference here today. It's also going to require us enlarging the pool of young people who are able to go on to higher education. And that means focusing in on young people early enough in their K-12 career to 
indicate to them that it's going to take more than just a high school education in order to get these decent jobs. And they need to be thinking about what they're going to be doing beyond K-12 at an early time. It's going to be a two-year community college or a four-year institution, going into the military, what have you. They have to start thinking about that early in their career so they can begin to plan and take the courses that are necessary to get them ready for that next step. It's also going to require a partnership. The partnership is being demonstrated here today between the education community, between government, between universities, between colleges, and with business. Because only with that kind of partnership are we ever going to be able to meet the challenge. We're not going to be able to sort of go off on our separate tracks and say, we're going to deal with this problem in our own way. We've got to have dialogue. We've got to have communication. We have to understand what the other element, the other factors are doing, and how we can bolster that, how we can support what's going on. And that's why I'm seeing so many good ideas come out of this group. I was very pleased to see the white paper that was distributed last year to talk about some of the things that could be done. There's some very specific ideas in there that I think we're going to focus in on. We're going to spend a few moments talking about it. But in order to try to approach this thing, there's certain solutions that I think we need to think about, particularly those of us who are concerned with the K-12. The first is we need to work on encouraging parents to participate in the educational process. We can talk until we're blue in the face about excellence in education. And indeed, our vision is achieving excellence in education to make Virginia's school system the best in the nation. We can talk about excellence until we're blue in the face, but until we get the participation of some specific people, it's not going to work. The first group of people who have to participate who have to be concerned are our parents, because the parents are the ones who shape those young people and give them that little boost at home that they need to realize that what they're doing is important. The parents have to participate they have to be involved in the educational system. And that's sometimes been taking some steps that may not be popular for young people. It means cutting off that television set sometimes to say, you're going to do your homework when you start looking at Dallas or Al or what have you. The point is those things may be entertaining, but they're not going to help you when you have to fill out a job application form or take a test or decide what your future is going to be all about. Parents can do that. We need to encourage our parents to participate in the educational system, to feel it so they can feel comfortable about coming into the schools and participating and to get them involved. And that's certainly something that we're going to be committed to, is to get our parents involved. We also have to be concerned about making sure that we have the best possible teachers and administrators in the school system. Because what really makes a difference is what goes on in that classroom between the teacher and the student, and also from the administrator's point of view as to the support they can give that particular relationship. We're going to be encouraging people to go into teaching, take a part in teaching because teaching is a profession that really is on the front line. Teachers have the responsibility of shaping the most precious natural resource we have, and that's our young people. And we ought to be behind our teachers to give them the support they need because you're the ones who are going to determine whether or not Johnny or Jane is going to have that interest spark in the second grade, the third grade, the sixth grade, the seventh grade, to want to go on and take advantage of the opportunity that will be presented to them. So we want to make sure that the teachers and administrators are very much a part of this because you're the ones who are going to make the difference between failure and success. We also have to be concerned about stressing basic skills. And that means making sure that all of our young people are able to read, to write, to think in a reasonable and analytical way, to understand the global perspective of what's happening in the world today. Larry, from an economic point of view, is going to tell you that we cannot operate in a vacuum here in Congress. We need to be concerned about what's happening around the world. What's happening in Eastern Europe, for instance, is very important to us because the fact that they're now coming out from under their communist domination means that they're going to be looking for opportunities to trade and to have relationships with other nations and with other states. It presents a terrific opportunity for those of us in this area to promote international trade. And Larry, I'm sure, is going to wonder that in some detail. But the point is, our young people have to understand how what's happening around the world impacts on the quality of life that we're going to enjoy here in the peninsula throughout the Commonwealth. So we've got to stress those basic skills, reading and writing, and an understanding of the global perspective. We also have to stress math and science. And that's why I'm so very glad to see that some of the workshops we're having, a lot of the discussion here, is focusing in on the need to have more training, more interest in the scientific, the technical, and mathematical aspects of curriculum. We've got to make sure that our young people feel comfortable with that. We have to make sure they understand how important it is. 
And we cannot wait until they're in the seventh and eighth grade, although obviously we're going to be focusing in on that. We've got to talk about what we have to do to our curriculum to make sure we can spark that interest in our young people in the second grade and the third grade so that they don't get caught up in that, in that uh, feeling that too many of us have, and that is that math and science are just too difficult. We can't match it. That's for somebody else. It's for the gifted kids, and we can't deal with it. That is not the case. We've got to do something about the public perception that math and science are too tough. They are not. The point is we need to approach the way we teach it in a way that makes it interesting, that encourages our young people to get interested in math and how it impacts on their lives. And that means looking at how we teach it, and that means making it more of an applied approach as opposed to just the learning the multiplication tables, learning the growth kinds of formulas, but understanding how math and science impact on your everyday life and making the teaching of math and science something that's exciting. Indeed, I hope some of you have been able to read the article in Newsweek magazine this week that's focusing in on how we ought to go about teaching science to make it more interesting, to make the young people want to go to science as opposed to running off in the other direction. That's a major task, but it's something that we cannot walk away from because if those young people are going to be prepared for the 21st century, they have to be comfortable with math and science because people elsewhere in the world are doing it. They're putting in time, they're putting in effort, and their young people are prepared. Our business is going to stay competitive. We have to make sure our young people are prepared for math and science. We also have to make sure that we develop good working relationships and good programs on our vocational and technical programs in schools. I'm proud of the fact that the Board of Education is currently involved in working with a number of you who are involved in vocational education to restructure it and to make it more relevant to what's going on in today's world, to make sure that you get the support you need to present those programs and that those programs have the kind of background and the basic skills that are necessary to prepare our young people. Because whether you're in vocational ed, whether you're in the academic track, or whatever you call it, you're an individual division, the bottom line is you have got to have a sound basis in math, in science, in reading, and in writing. So that's why I'm glad that we're trying to work with you to come up with a program that will reflect that reality. We're also concerned about the fact that we need to get more women and minorities into the scientific and technical fields. We have got to reach out. The figures I think I've seen indicate that maybe 28% of the scientists and mathematicians are women and only 2% are minorities. The point is those numbers do not reflect what the demographics of the workforce are going to be. And that means we're going to have to have some aggressive programs in place to make sure that we can encourage minorities and women to go into math and into science. And that, once again, means changing some public perception, because for too long we've been encouraging these groups to go in the opposite direction. Math and science don't present opportunities for you, and you ought to be thinking about other things. And I've been hearing about little specific examples, the comments the teachers can make to people can do a lot about determining whether or not they've got that motivation to go on. So we've got to encourage minorities and women to go into these areas because we need them. Once again, not only because it's morally correct, but from a financial, business from a profit point of view, we need every resource available in order to be competitive, in order to keep our edge as the leader of the free world. And that means educated workforce. We're also concerned about making sure we do all we can to get the business community involved. And that means creating new programs, programs such as the one we're participating in today. We have to let business know that we are prepared to work with them in a meaningful manner, in an open, ongoing dialogue work together on a common problem. And that's why I'm so glad that in this particular area, you've had that interest demonstrated by the business community. And I think that one of the things we're going to try to do is to pick up some examples of what you're doing here, try to spread that across the Commonwealth to see if we can get other businesses involved in working with our educational system. Some of the recommendations that are coming out of this particular white paper and your discussions, I think, uh, work uh, me spending a few minutes talking about because I think that's a very important. For one, the establishment, establishment of the regional middle school career program that will focus in on the scientific and technical areas, where schools will be visited by scientists, by engineers, by people from the private sector, who will spend some time with our middle school students to let them know what's available in the job market. I think that's absolutely on point. And I would hope that those of you who are in the educational system be actively involved in that program to make it work. Because we've got to let our young people see some role models of what's going on in that area, what's being done, the opportunities offered them. 
And so I would encourage and support those kinds of efforts. I would also support the approach for the Regional Math and Science Summer Program, which will focus in on some of the underachievers to motivate some kids in the seventh, and eighth, and ninth grade who may not be doing as well as they can be in math and science, and encourage them to participate in this program, to motivate them, to give them the inspiration. You'd be amazed how much of a difference you can make by showing a little effort, a little concern for these young people, to let them know that indeed they put forth that effort, that there will be something at the end of that rainbow that you could make a difference in their lives. And I'm glad that you're doing that, and I encourage that to move forward. Also, the memory programs that I understand being put in place that will allow the, I think the Chamber of Commerce is going to be working with on some mentoring programs so that there will be an ongoing relationship so that people will understand what's happening in the business community and how they can be a part of that. Those are the kind of efforts that will make us achieve our goal of excellence in education, of a full working partnership between the business community and the educational system. But all of this rhetoric, all of these plans will not work unless those of you who are in the educational system are committed to it. Because you're going to make the difference. You're going to be in the classroom with these young people. You're going to be the ones answering their questions about, well, gee, do I really have to study math and science? Do I really have to be concerned about analytical thinking? Yes, they have to be concerned. Because if they're going to get a meaningful job, they have to be prepared. And they also not only have to have the basic skills, but they also have to have the ability to adapt to changes in the workforce. We have to become a, a community of lifelong learners. Because the job qualifications, the skills required, are going to be changing almost on an annual basis. And now people have to be prepared to adapt to those changes. It has to be a lifelong learning process. And that means you're going to have to be involved beyond the K-12 experience, working with community colleges and others to participate in making sure that those people who are already in the workforce are able to come back and be retrained and retooled to have the skills that are going to be required down the road. It's a big job, but it's a job that can be done. And if there's nothing else that I want to stress to you, it's a partnership, and it's a partnership that cannot work unless you are actively involved. You can make a difference. We can talk about policy. If you're in the classroom, you will make a difference. And so I would urge you to help us in any way you can to participate, to welcome the business community, to work hard with these young people, to make this program a success because you will determine whether or not our future is as bright as it can be. Thank you for allowing me to spend a few moments with you, and I look forward to getting a chance to talk to each one of you individually. Thank you very much.
good news? We are doing a terrific job in preparing bright, innovative, creative, tremendously well-educated workers for our American workforce, our Virginia workforce, and our Catholic workforce. The bad news. We are not doing a very good job of preparing innovative, creative, knowledgeable workers for our American, Virginia, and Tidewater workforce. What? Good news and bad news is the same yet. We know that we create here in Virginia, from our educational system, a tremendously talented and bright and well-trained students. But we've also found that we fail. That's our task. It's to build on our successes and lift them to cure our failures. What we talk about this morning is something that is, I'm excited about because it is well, it is so important to the economic future of all of us. It's the need for secondary schools, higher educational institutions, and the business community to work together in partnership to build an effective workforce today for the 1990s and beyond. The problem we have today is a current problem as well as a future problem. We need to address the attitudes in our current workforce as well as those in the future workforce. You know, for many years, our workforce depended in large part upon a demand for workers for jobs that were relatively unskilled, they carried out the more menial functions of the manufacturing process. We also know today that there are fewer and fewer of those jobs available. As our industries move towards a more service-oriented and more highly technical-oriented production, we find that the need for the unskilled job has been reduced. Today, in my work at McDonald's, to the people that sweep the parties. And we know as well that you cannot support family, indeed, you cannot support yourself working behind the counter or sweeping the floor at a fast food restaurant. No, we have a great gap. And that's what our task is here, if you start today, to address. How do we begin to bring those who would only fill the jobs that cannot support them or family and bring them into the workforce that we need for the night. A major study conducted recently by the Virginia Small Business Advisory Task Force using focus groups from throughout the state of the leaders of a great number of small and medium-sized businesses made findings that were deeply disturbing. Here's what they found. They found overwhelming that these companies believe that their most significant problems were one, a lack of qualified entry-level workforce, and two, a lack of basic and occupational skills. The study stated, and I quote, employers express that they are experiencing extreme difficulty in finding entry-level employees with basic skills, i.e. reading, computational, and human relations. Additionally, nearly two-thirds of the participants in that survey found that availability of quality labor was the number one inhibitor to the expansion of their business. And we know that the tremendous economic success of the gentleman over the last few years has been fueled not so much by the importation and attraction of new businesses to Virginia, but well over 60% of the new jobs created in Virginia in the last four years have been created by the expansion of existing business. However, the problems of an, of an inadequate workforce are not limited to small and medium-sized businesses. Studies have also shown that large multinational corporations are being forced to export many of their high-skilled and high-paying jobs overseas because they simply cannot find qualified workers in the United States. We think of exported jobs as being cutting and sewing of fabric of assembling plastic trinkets in Hong Kong, but no, jobs being exported today are highly skilled jobs. Unless you think it is something limited only Virginia, let me quote from the editor of a Brookings Institution study of the American Workforce, 
released and reported two days ago. He said, our problem is not that we are drowning in a sea of lousy jobs. Rather, we have a surplus of workers and employers who must consider lousy. That is, workers who are relatively unskilled. Specifically, businesses have consistently complained about the lack of math, science, foreign language, and computer training among our workforce. As we have noted, a growing number of jobs in our economy will depend on technical skills derived from these basic skills. Having these skills will provide the flexibility and ability to retrain and adjust to the dynamic workforce required to meet the demands of the economy. This leads us to another important basic deficiency in our current workforce, the lack of an adequate retraining system. Studies tell us that the average worker entering the workforce today will hold six new jobs during his or her career and must be retrained at least three times. As we continue to move into our high-tech service sector economy, more and more workers will need to be retrained to fit the growing demand in many areas. Partnership between businesses educational institutions will provide a critical link to fill this vacuum. It is essential to create this cooperation, to provide this missing link, these skills that are deficient in our current workforce. Dr. Temple, what you and members of the academic and business community, what your industry task force have done through your innovative efforts of this white paper, and what you are doing today will help begin to fill this gap that so desperately needs to be addressed. You have established the beginning of a mechanism that addresses our current deficiencies in math, science, and technical skills, and badly needed mentors that can provide incentive to your students to initiate and continue their improvement. One of the most compelling reasons why we so desperately need this partnership is because we can look out to the constantly changing world around us and see tremendous results from what other countries have done along these lines. In West Germany, they have one of the world's best apprenticeship programs called the Dual System because it is jointly operated by industry and the vocational and educational <coughs> institution of every German state. German children are introduced to a working environment, often before the age of 10. By the 10th grade, about 8% of these students enter the Dual System. They will choose from among hundreds of occupations and acquire an apprenticeship in a private company in their chosen field and spend the next three years developing their skills, four days a week on the job to gain practical <coughs> skills, and one day a week to gain theoretical skills. The system has been extraordinarily effective in driving one of the most productive economies in the world. Now, while I'm not advocating such a rigid system in our country, the basic case for industrial and educational cooperation is so compelling that we have much to learn from our competitors. Similarly, earlier this week, I was in Gaylax, Virginia, the small town in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in southwest Virginia, to dedicate the opening of a state-of-the-art glass and mirror manufacturing firm. In fact, the most technologically advanced mirror manufacturing firm in the country. As I walked through the plant for an hour and a half with Chairman Bobby Frost, I noticed that not a single piece not a single piece of the high technology production equipment in that plant, with the exception of the water treatment facility, was manufactured in the United States. I saw machines manufactured in Switzerland, in Italy, in Germany. Not a single one in the United States. I asked him, Bobby, how can the Italians and the Germans and the Swiss outproduce us in high technology equipment. And for use in such a basic industry as the glass and mirror manufacturing. His answer was very interesting and very revealing. He told me that when he went to Switzerland recently to look at this equipment, he saw an unparalleled commitment to training the Swiss workforce at an early age. Not only did their secondary education consist of more math and more science, but they were additionally required to participate in a two-year apprenticeship program with the company of their choosing. In short, they received a sophisticated training in a specific field at a very early age 
which enabled them to become more competently trained quicker and apply and develop new technology faster and more efficiently. These public and private partnerships have been in place in some countries for decades, but in many others, like ours, they are just now becoming significant tools for economic growth. While we have already noted the current inadequacies in our workforce and looked at models of successful partnerships, perhaps the most significant reason for coordinated action is to give our economy a long-term solution to its problem. All too often, our businesses and industries are geared towards meeting quarterly profit margins and satisfying investor demands at the annual board meeting. The result is that businesses do not invest enough, not only in their research and development, but also the most important long-term investment of all, the people who provide the workforce that provide the labor, that provide the machines, that provide the profits. The country that has best demonstrated the importance of this long-term investment is in Japan. Through governmental orchestration, through METI and JETRA, the Japanese are taught to think in decades, not in months. They pour an enormous share of their gross national product into research and development and into education. They put particular emphasis on establishing an educational network that trains students in math, science, and the skills necessary to compete in a high-tech world. The results, as we all know, have been staggering. The beauty of such an investment is that it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle of success and productivity. The more money a country invests in education, the more it multiplies for future generations when they become the labor force. 20 or 30 years ago, the United States had the luxury of being able to find a domestic market for its expanding industries. Today, in our global village, interdependent global economy, General Motors no longer really compete with Ford or Chrysler. They compete with the auto manufacturers of other countries. Long-term thinking additionally gives industries the means to be on the forefront of new technology. The rise of overseas countries who do provide cheap, skilled labor, it makes it vital that the United States provide high-tech services and not attempt to provide low-cost labor. I'll never forget a trip that I took recently to the People for Public China, and a visit made there to a joint venture assembly plant for the MD83, a joint venture with McDonald Douglas. In that assembly plant, products manufactured in the United States in component form were shipped or assembled. You know, we think oftentimes of assembly in China as being small, put together the two pieces of plastic. What I saw there was high-tech assembly. Assembly of sophisticated jet airplane components into the final product. And I sat in the office of the console in Shanghai, near where this plant is located. And heard him tell me that not a week before, a Federal Aviation Administration certification crew had been through that plant and seen the first of the MD-83s that rolled off that assembly line and commented that it was among the best assembled, highest quality assembled MD-83 they could see anywhere in the world. And it came home to me that those young, and they were young, the average age of those workers were about 22 years old. Those young, skilled laborers assembling that jet commercial aircraft were getting paid in a month about what the American manufacturing worker gets paid in a day. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot compete with skilled, low-cost labor unless we are prepared to train our businesses and our workforce to stay on the cutting edge of creativity and of innovation. That's where America excels. That's where Virginia excels. That's where our strength is. And we're going to have to play to our strength. And we are not going to play to that strength unless we are prepared to commit the energy and the effort and the resources to educate in partnership with business and education the workers that possess the kinds of skills that can continue to be creative and innovative and understand the needs of the high-tech assembly line. <coughs> there, are, there are examples right here in Taiwan of this 
result of long-term investment. In our own backyard, we had the shining success of the Fort Hampton Road. In the early 1980s, the managers of the Port Authority made a wise decision to stop trying to play catch-up ball and meet only current demands for available technology. And the Commonwealth, through the Port Authority, took a bold gamble and invested tens of millions of dollars in the high-tech Port Authority facility that you see every day. And it paid off. Because today, that high technology is attracting over 23 new shipping lines just in the last 18 months or so. It has significantly decreased the offloading cost and the onloading cost and continue today to draw more and more shippers. And that means more and more jobs to the Tidewater area of Virginia. Another successful example of long-term thinking here is New Virginia Shipbuilding and Dry Dock and their apprenticeship school. Every year, the company recruits, trains, and puts to work hundreds of individuals. They make the investment to train the students at a high skill level that will be demanded of them once they join the labor force. The result is a symbiotic relationship mutually beneficial for the individual and to the industry. I joined with Secretary Dyke in asking each and every one of you to join with me, to join with us, Join with the industry task force and those in business who agree and feel deeply with them in a partnership to create consistently the kind of workforce that we need in Virginia to truly compete in the global economy. If you are successful, and it is you, because it is you, it is you to educate this workforce. If you are successful, you will lead not only here on the peninsula, but you will lead in the Commonwealth and you will lead in our nation. You will set the pace. And it starts here. It starts today with these initiatives. Dr. Templin, as I close, I want you to know that there is nothing more important than what you and your colleagues and your task forces are doing because it is you that are creating the tools with which we will either be able to compete or be unsuccessful in competing in the world marketplace. I give you my support. I wish you well. I look forward to using your efforts as a model statewide, and I thank you for the honor and the privilege to be here and share the talk with you as well. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. 